As global economies strengthen, one needs to be aware that if a single day is lost in the North American supply chain due to regional snags, the time and trade advantage will be lost to sourcing and shipping from Asia. When it comes to speed bumps on today's trade avenues, the long-term relationships our two countries, business communities have enjoyed, can even lull us into a sense of complacency. That's why we must continuously ask ourselves, what's next? How do we create a sense of urgency? What succeeds NAFTA? What regulations or infrastructure impedes economic growth and creates obstacles to time and trade? And, what, and with that urgency, must we undertake these hurdles as the world shifts around us? So how can we boost North American prosperity in a synchronized world? It requires a public-private response of vision, mindset, and action. A broad effort to unclog our border crossings as traffic volume builds is paramount. There's no way to overstate how important it is to manage our border crossings progressively. Over the next 30 years, cross-border trucking, according to one study, is, expe is expected to increase by 130%. What's at stake is how well we manage these crossings to be time and trade competitive versus our partners on the other side of the world. Additionally, after two decades of NAFTA trade, we still have slow moving paper processes in place for movement of low risk goods between our two countries. We can easily take action to simplify the clearance of low risk goods and look for additional ways to synchronize and simplify onerous processes between the two countries. By inaction, we continue to impede time and trade. Those are obvious and urgent issues. They're tied directly to making time and trade a key response to the shifts in the way commerce now flows around the world. A couple of additional efforts that UPS, through its advocacy, is trying to influence, and that is to change that we urge business leaders to do the same. We need to help our policymakers maintain a consistent strategy to help accelerate trade. For example, even though the G20 leaders of the world's top economies signed a pledge last November to spurn protectionism, 17 of the 20 have implemented 47 measures that do the exact opposite through increased measures resulting in thickening borders, increasing fees, inspections, documents, and wait times. Additionally, as many of, our, of you understand, we need to prepare for the economic growth that's coming around the corner by investing in infrastructure. U.S. infrastructure earned a grade D according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, citing that the U.S. is investing in infrastructure at the same rate they did in 1968 when the U.S. economy was one-third smaller. In conclusion, major benefits flow from the Canada-U.S. relationship, namely millions of jobs that we have all heard about and a vast positive impact on both economies. As we are in the midst of a global shift, Canada and the U.S. must identify ways to eliminate impediments and reduce border costs in the short term and increase the competitiveness of our industries in the long term. Improving supply chains and border access is vital to economic recovery and long-term health. We need a coordinated approach, maybe from the Canada Studies section. We need a coordinated approach for both countries to remove barriers to cross-border trade and enhance time and trade. I began today with a video uh, which shared a lot of data with you, a video that I think sometimes if you have time, go see the updated version on, uh, on YouTube because the world is watching and the world is changing, the world is shifting. But I want to sh share with you one last statistic as we close. The World Trade Organization estimates that cutting trade barriers across agriculture, manufacturing, and services by one-third would add more than $600 billion to the world economy and help prosperity in many nations. That's the equivalent of adding an economy the size of Canada to the world market. Thank you. Now, would you say the single greatest bottleneck to economic growth is government? You know, I have to work with them when I wake up in the morning. No, I, I, you know what I would tell you? The, the single biggest hurdle is there's no sense of urgency. 
I don't think government is a bottleneck. I think the lack of urgency, the lack of focus. Like I said, I was just over in China, and if I'm a policymaker and I, I go visit China, and I bring all my congressmen and senators with me, and I say, look at what I'm looking at, wake up. That's my answer. You know, uh, energy prices and oil is obviously important to EPS, um, and and for us, we have um, we've got a rolling laboratory for the last ten years. We don't talk a lot about it, but we've been experimenting uh, with about six hundred different vehicles on alternate fuels. And to answer your question, for us to do that for a company that you know EPS measures everything. Everything that moves at EPS, we measure. And if it doesn't move, we kick it, so it moves, and then we measure it. <laughs> so for us to commit over the last 10 years to, to studying alternate fuels and energy, that means to me um, that we're taking it seriously and it will be an issue, and, and we all need to look at another alternative to, to what we're doing today. What can we Are do you to, allowed to ask a question? <laughs> with government access. Uh, what, what can we do to improve education in terms of communication and transportation so that younger generations and even you know the broader public is aware of how things are changing? You know, I think there's a lot of great lobby groups. There's trucking organizations and associations and Canadian American associations. Uh, it's probably a similar answer to the answer I had before, which is, how do you weave all that? How do you become the honest broker between all of it? How do you create the critical mass so that all those bodies have some kind of core sense of elements on educating either the young or the, the CFO or the executive suite in regards to how important it is um, for energy security, for near sourcing, and for competitiveness? I think all the bodies are out there, it just lacks some kind of coordinated effort. There are no new answers. It's just the same answers that we had before, but acting on them. 